In early October, Hamas fired thousands of missiles at Israel, plunging the two into yet another conflict. But through it all, Israel has kept their main airport open and flight operations happen in daily. This is pretty unprecedented for most nations, but not for Israel. But they're able to do this because of two real main things. First, really key flight operation management, and two, their heralded Iron Dome missile defense system. But we're starting to see some cracks in the armor. And in fact, Israel is deploying their next generation Iron Beam, a laser-based defense system, earlier than expected. So how does it work, and can it keep Israel safe? Let's figure this out together. I'm Ricky, and this is 2 Vinci. Obviously, the ongoing conflict is affecting flights. Here's a quick look at their flight board for October 15th. And you'll see there are a lot of cancellations, but there are still flights. For example, this one here and a couple down here. Now, this is pretty unconventional. Most countries in the event of armed conflict, missile launches, would close their airspace. But Israel can ill afford to do this because they're a small country and they're not surrounded by allies. Compare that to the U.S. that we have so many different airports that we can reroute traffic to to get things in and out. Israel doesn't have that luxury and that's why they have to keep this closed. But to talk about how this is possible, how they could possibly keep open active commercial flights in and out of the country in a war zone, let's talk about how we got here. On October 7th at 6.30 a.m., Israeli air raid sirens began sounding to let the people of Jerusalem know that they were under attack and that they should take cover immediately. An estimated 2,200 rockets were fired towards southern and central Israel, including Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, by the Hamas militants, according to the IDF. Meanwhile, Hamas claims that at least 5,000 rockets were fired, all landing in southern and central Israel. Hamas is an acronym. Israel estimates that the group has around 30,000 fighters and an arsenal of rockets and unmanned drones. In 2006, Hamas won parliamentary elections, and in 2007, the group violently seized control of the Gaza Strip from the Palestinian Authority. There have been no elections since. The U.S. State Department and other nations around the world designated Hamas a terrorist group in 1997. Hamas receives financial, material, and logistical support from Iran, though so far international leaders, including Israel, have said there is no evidence that Iran was directly involved in Hamas's recent attack. The day after Hamas launched its attack, Hezbollah also fired dozens of rockets and shells at three Israeli positions in disputed areas along the country's border with Syria and the Golan Heights. Like Hamas, Hezbollah is designated a terrorist terrorist group by the U.S. and opposes Israel. So Israel is surrounded by its enemies from different directions. So who are Israel's allies? Well, that would be the U.S. In fact, Israel has received more foreign aid from the U.S. than any other country. A Congressional Research Service report published in March 2023 states in total the U.S. has sent $158 billion in aid to Israel. And this gets to the heart of why Israel doesn't close its airspace in times of trouble. Keeping the Israeli airspace open can provide a vital corridor for Israel to allow people in and out of the country for soldiers to return and goods and supplies to continue entering the country in times of conflict. To keep any semblance of security for their airport operations, they rely largely on two things. One, is handling threats and uprises on the ground and rerouting flights to avoid areas of conflict with up-to-date information in real time. What Israel has experience with that very few other countries do is this level of heightened awareness and threat levels so often. So what they do is they'll see where activity is happening and route traffic accordingly. This isn't the first Israeli-Palestine conflict. It's not the second. It's not the third. So why does this keep happening? I think to answer that, we need to dig deeper a little bit further into the past. November 2nd, 1917, Britain's then Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour wrote a letter addressed to Lionel Walter Rothschild, a figurehead of the British Jewish community. The letter was short, just 67 words, but its contents and the subsequent activities that would happen have had a lasting impact on Palestine and the world. It committed the British government to an establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and in facilitating the achievement of this objective. The letter is known as the Balfour Declaration. A British mandate was created in 1923 and lasted until 1948. During that period, the British facilitated mass Jewish immigration over 375,000 people in that period, many fleeing from Nazism in Europe. The Palestinians were alarmed by the country's changing demographics and Britain's confiscation of their lands to be handed over to Jewish settlers. An estimated 750,000 Palestinians were forced out of their homes. On May 15, 1948, Israel announced its establishment. The Nakba, also known as the Palestinian Catastrophe, was a destruction of Palestinian society and its homeland, an event that is honored in Palestine every year on May 15th, and regular infighting has 
boiled up ever since. This sounds like the perfect recipe for perpetual conflict. And I can't think of any answers to this problem, honestly. One proposed solution has been the two-state solution, an agreement that would create a state for the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip alongside Israel. Hamas has rejected such a notion and has sworn to the ultimate destruction of Israel. Israel has said a Palestinian state must be demilitarized so as to not be a threat. So clearly that hasn't happened yet. Then there's a question of settlements outside of the realm of the original boundaries of Israel. Some countries have deemed Jewish settlements built on land Israel occupied in 1967 as illegal. Israel disputes this and cites historical and biblical ties to the land. This continued expansion has been at the heart of why this issue has been so contentious for so long. And honestly, there seems to be no end in sight. Let's talk a little bit about Israel's airports and how they're operating in times of war. First, they have Ben Gurion International Airport in Tel Aviv. This is their main airport. This is the big one. If you're going to fly into Israel, it'll be this one. There's also Haifa Airport and Ramon Airport and different parts of the country. Now, Haifa and Ramon airports have both largely shut down. There are no active flight operations in and out of those two airports unless there's some sort of rerouting or special use case. But by and large, they've shut those down leaving Ben-Gurion International open. And it's about 40 miles outside of Jerusalem. And as we've shown, there are still flights operating in and out of this airport, even during this conflict. But the main reason they're able to do this is because of the Iron Dome. As an aerospace engineer, this system is kind of fascinating. So I thought I'd take a closer look at exactly how it works. The Iron Dome's development started in 2006 with the goal of countering rocket attacks during the war with Hezbollah in Lebanon. It was developed by the Israeli defense company Rafael Advanced Defense Systems. That name will come back here in a minute, and was funded by the U.S. through a $200 million grant. Israel deployed the Iron Dome in March 2011, and it made its first successful interception of a rocket fired from Gaza on April 7th that year. Later in 2017, Israel developed a modified version of the Iron Dome battery for a maritime interception system to protect strategic targets like oil rigs. And in 2021, the system was upgraded to intercept drones. The system was originally fully owned by the Israelis, but thanks to the amount of funding that the U.S. was providing, Israel agreed to share the technology in 2014 through a co-production agreement. Thanks to this agreement in 2020, Rafael and the Massachusetts-based military contractor Raytheon formed a joint venture, and Raytheon has been manufacturing the Iron Dome's Tamir missiles and other components in its defense facilities in Tucson, Arizona ever since. Part of that agreement is that Israel must spend half of the U.S. military aid with U.S.-based military contractors like Raytheon. To date, the U.S. has provided almost $3 billion to Israel for the Iron Dome system alone. This is part of the $38 billion in military aid approved by the U.S. government for the 10-year period between 2016 and 2026. The Iron Dome is made up of three components, an advanced ELM multi-mission radar system, a mobile battle management and weapon control system, and a battery of three to four rocket launchers, each carrying 20 Tamir interceptor missiles. It's a transportable system towed by trucks that can be set up in a couple of hours. Each Iron Dome battery is designed to protect a populated area of 60 square miles or 150 square kilometers, which is roughly the size of Newark, New Jersey, or two and a half times the size of Manhattan. This represents a radius of 4.3 miles or seven kilometers. Israel has at least 10 Iron Dome batteries deployed in its territory, although one source says that might be 11. We'll get back to this in a minute because it has everything to do with why some of the cheap Hamas rockets actually made it through the dome and hit targets. Trust me, you're not going to want to miss that part. But before we get into that, there's something I'd like to address. Israel is a small country. We can fit Israel into a rectangle of about 276 miles by 95 miles, about the size of West Virginia. But even then, you might be thinking 10 Iron Dome battery systems might not be enough. Might it be too little, especially if each one only has a radius of 4.3 miles. I thought so too. My first thought was there have to be way more of these than 10 or 11. I thought there'd be hundreds. So to see just how effective this system and having 10 of them would be, I took a map of Israel and laid out some 4.3 mile radius circles across their two most dangerous borders, Gaza and Lebanon. Even if you slightly overlap the circles, you can clearly tell that you don't need more than 10 or 11 batteries to protect both borders from Hamas and Hezbollah. Also, this leaves a clear open corridor for commercial jets to enter Israeli airspace. So Israel has between 600 and 800 Tamir interceptors loaded and ready to fire at any given time that they receive incoming missile warnings. Roughly half of them are on each border. The Tamir interceptor missile is about 10 feet long, has a diameter of 6 inches, and weighs almost 200 pounds. 
It's specifically designed to intercept small, unguided, short-range rockets, mortars, heavy artillery shells, and drones that move relatively slowly with a predictable trajectory. The Tamir missile flies at a maximum speed of Mach 2.2, over twice the speed of sound, and has a range of 4 to 43 miles. This was a bit confusing for me because both the radar system and the rocket have a 40 mile range, yet the radius of the area they can protect is only 4.3 miles. And the only possible explanation I could think of is that it takes time for the system to identify, track, calculate the trajectory, launch the interceptor missile, and have it reach its target. Let's talk about how the Iron Dome actually works. A radar unit first detects and tracks incoming rockets. The radar can detect up to 1,100 missiles simultaneously from 4 to 70 kilometers away. Each shell speed and trajectory data is relayed to a mobile control unit which calculates where it'll hit. So imagine that you have a radar system that is sending out radar waves and receiving the, the return bounce off these rockets. You can track up to 1100, which is truly amazing. That's a testament to how much computational power has increased over the years. The radar is kind of still the same. But from there, you have to track it over time. The first data point says, hey, there is a missile right there. With one data point, you can't tell anything. You don't know what, where, which direction it's going in. Then you wait a second, whatever the frequency of, of sampling is, and then you track it again. And now you say, okay, well, cover this much distance. So from that... If you know how long it's been and how far it's traveled, you can start to predict where it's headed. Now, we mentioned the Iron Dome only works for unguided systems. So those are ballistic trajectories, right? That is a very clear path. And what you can start to do is you can start to say, it's here, it's here, it's going to land there. One of the key things to the Iron Dome is to prioritize. So there's a triage system. When they queue threats, what they always do is high priority threats and targets are always brought to the forefront because there might be a chance that some of them will get through. And so their goal is to protect the most important targets first. Some of these missiles, again, they're not guided, so they're not going to hit any target. They're going to hit land where there's nothing around. So what they'll do is they'll map out a target and say, here's the areas that we need to protect. This missile is headed here, not going to hit anything, lower priority. And they'll keep triaging the system and queuing up targets and taking them down. That way they can protect it. But there are some shortfalls that we'll see here in a second. When each rocket is launched, it's first guided by the ground radar through a data link. Then it switches to an onboard seeker radar for more accuracy. Once it's close enough, a proximity detonator triggers a blast fragmentation warhead and destroys the target. So, fun fact, the Tamir interceptor missile never actually touches or intercepts incoming rockets. It detonates close to it, and all the fragments that come off of it trigger the explosion of the incoming missile. Compared to other defense systems, the Iron Dome isn't particularly expensive, but its cost can really add up. A single Iron Dome battery cost about $100 million, so that 10 batteries in total, that's over a billion already. Then each Tamir missile costs around forty to $60,000. For context, the US Patriot missile used in our air defense systems costs $4.1 million each. That's 100 times more expensive. So Tamirs are relatively cheap, but they can still add up if you have to launch thousands of them over time. The good news is that they're very effective. Depending on who you ask, the Iron Dome has an accuracy of 90 to 97%. However, it still has a weakness. As we did the research on the Iron Dome, one thing became increasingly clear. It can be easily overwhelmed if you fire enough rockets. And that's what Hamas did last October 7th. Before that day, and ever since the Iron Dome first came to operation in 2011, it had intercepted almost 2,000 rockets, which sounds impressive. That's 2,000 rockets in 12 years. The morning of October 7th, Hamas launched at least 2,200 rockets in the span of 20 minutes. Not only that, but their missiles were also more accurate than usual. Hamas has been improving its rockets accuracy significantly throughout the years. In 2012, only about 22% of all rockets they launched actually reached populated areas or strategic targets. Fast forward to 2021, and that percentage has increased to 50%, and today it's likely even higher. This means in the past, the Iron Dome could safely ignore 78% of incoming rockets, but in 2023, it had to deal with at least half of everything Hamas sent Israel's way. In the best cases, the Iron Dome had to cope with 50% of 2,200 rockets in a span of 20 minutes. That's 1,100 rockets. But only about half of the batteries were probably on the southern border. That means that only 300 to 400 loaded Tamir missiles were ready to launch. 
This also implies that they had to reload all the rocket launchers at least three times in a span of 20 minutes. From what I could find, it would take anywhere between a few minutes to 10 minutes or more to reload a rocket launcher. So you can tell that the Iron Dome was really tested pretty much to its limit. There's a reason why 3% of rockets come through. And remember, 3% of 1,100 is still 33 rockets reaching targets. And that is loss of life that is unimaginable. The rockets that Hamas are firing are much cheaper. They're unguided. They're dumb. They're probably in the range of $300 to $800 a piece. And Israel is launching forty dollars to $60,000 Tamir missiles to intercept it. But ultimately, it's a war of attrition. And it's one that nobody is going to win. What would happen if all the Tamir missiles were used up? How many do you have to keep on stock? Or what if you can overload the system fast enough? Ultimately, the Iron Dome's great limitation is speed. If you launch 2,000 missiles over 10 years, odds are they can detect and intercept all of them. How about in 10 minutes? Could you launch 2,000 missiles in 10 minutes? If you could, the game changes entirely. And that's because of how sophisticated tracking and triaging and monitoring all those threats in real time becomes. This brings us to the latest and greatest next generation technology called Iron Beam, which uses a fiber laser to destroy airborne targets. It can operate as a standalone system or with external queuing as part of Israel's larger air defense network. A threat is detected by a surveillance system and tracks the vehicle's platform to engage. The main advantages of using a directed energy weapon laser over conventional missile interceptors are lower cost per shot, roughly $2 versus $50,000 per missile unlimited firings, lower operational cost, and less manpower. There's also no interceptor debris to fall back onto protected areas. According to a 2020 report, the fiber laser used in the iron beam system uses around tens of kilowatts of energy. Now, in the future, that might be in the hundreds of kilowatts, but this 2020 report says a system of that magnitude would have a seven kilometer range around four miles or so. So this would be able to fill in the areas that the Iron Dome couldn't fill in. So you'd need more of these, but potentially you could track some of the targets that would not be able to be reached and eliminated from Iron Dome. The benefits, again, no reloading. You don't have to have missiles reloaded into, into, into rocket launchers. And all you're using up is electricity. So as long as you have electricity, these systems can continually track targets. But the cons of an iron beam system is that it can only track one thing at a time. And it actually takes a little bit of time, between three and five seconds, depending on the laser intensity, to heat up the weapon to the point where it'll explode. So you have to track a weapon, one, two, three, four, five, and keep that laser fixed on your target. Pros, yes, unlimited firing. You don't have to reload anything. You can just keep tracking new targets, but you would need a ton of these systems if you were to launch 2,000 weapons, as you can imagine. As, as we mentioned, this iron beam system was not supposed to be deployed yet. They were, they're probably not fully worked out all the bugs. They probably haven't gone through all the scenarios and training even. But because of this new conflict, here in 2023, they've fast-tracked its release and they're planning to put Iron Beam into application here in the coming weeks. Their goal, again, is going to be to supplement, right? They're not going to replace Iron Dome. Iron Dome can do things that this can't as of now, but this would just be an additional member of the team. And it's developed by the same company that developed Iron Dome. So you can tell that they're going to work together in their network to queue and prioritize targets and, and work within their system. Another real major limitation is weather for these laser-based systems. A really foggy day would attenuate the laser and spread it so much that it would never be able to destroy a target. You know, the engineering that goes into these systems is truly advanced, and this is just the world. This is the scenario that Israel's had to fight with. But this story... It's truly heartbreaking. And I urge everyone to remember, this is not a sport. There's, there's no teams. I'm on this side or that side. These are people. These are people who, many of whom had no interest in this fight, who just are trying to live their lives and are caught in this in this constant level of, of battle. Also, as horrible as, as this is, it has the potential to spread around the world. On last Friday... There were threats that there might be terrorist attacks in other parts, like here in the U.S. And so people were thinking that maybe keep your kids home from school that day. This is not just a local problem. This has the potential to boil over to many other parts of the world. And 
it's complicated. And I'll tell you, think like an engineer doesn't really apply here. There are no answers that I have for this conflict. Who's in the right? Who's in the wrong? I don't know. That's beyond my skill set or my understanding or my knowledge. And I truly don't have words to talk about this. This is one of those videos I didn't want to do because I don't have a good answer for it. Um, I just don't. The best I could give, the best advice I could give would be on an individual family person level and not on a country level and on a battlefield level. But if you don't want anything to do with this, I would just say move. This is unlikely to change anytime soon, truly. And if you want to protect your family and you don't want to be involved in the conflict and this question of whose rightful land is it and everything else, you should probably move. Because in my opinion, as a father, as a family man, no land, no conflict is worth all of this. And our family literally moved around the world when I was young for a better life. That's kind of the nature of the world. It's a big world out there. And ultimately, this is one of those hard, hard problems. Peace in the Middle East. I don't know. I'd love to hear your guys' take. Hopefully that gives you an idea of the importance of Israeli airspace to their sovereignty and why these systems are in place. The rest and all the politics, I'll leave that to all of you. I truly don't have words for this or, or what's happening, but I'm afraid that this will just keep on happening and that this is just a, a story that will break headlines time and time and time and time again. All right, sign up in the comments below. I'm Rick Da Vinci. Thanks so much for watching.